This is part one in a series of lectures on the age of European expansionism and exploration to 1585 AD. In this lecture, I'll be considering motivations for the age of expansionism. The age of European expansionism and exploration, approximately from the beginning of the 15th century until the middle of the 17th century, is a loosely defined term for the period in European and world history in which extensive overseas exploration emerged as a powerful factor in European culture and which marked the beginning of what today we call globalization. In this lecture and in part two, I'll be considering the motivating factors for European expansionism, and in later lectures, I'll be taking a look at the direct impacts of the age of exploration upon society at the time and all the way up to the present day. If you look at this slide here, it says the age of exploration to 1585 AD, and then at the bottom it says, or is it 1585 CE? I want to take a moment right here at the beginning of this lecture to talk about how in history years are described. For many, many years, years before the birth of Christ were referred to with the term BC. Today, it is becoming much more common for the term BCE, or before the Common Era, to be used because it is less Christian-centric. The same thing is true with the term AD, which stands for Anno Domini, or the Year of Our Lord, and nowadays it is becoming much more common to use the term CE, or Common Era. In this class, I'll be using both BC and BCE and AD and CE kind of interchangeably. But I wanted to make you aware of that right at the very beginning of the class. What I want to talk about today are some of the motivating factors for European expansionism. This will be done in two parts. This is the first part, dealing with just a few of these motivating factors. For Europeans, sometimes the factors were very simple, basic human emotions. They explored, they expanded their horizons because of a sense of adventure, of wanting to get out and see what was beyond yonder rock or over uh, the hill. Sometimes it was a quest for knowledge. This was particularly true as Europe was emerging from the Dark Ages in which the world was, was built around legend and superstition, and they were starting to discover that there were things that they didn't understand, and they were curious about how the world worked. European expansionism fed into that desire. There was also just basic greed. Human beings are greedy, and Europeans in particular were especially greedy for gold and silver. It was a major motivating factor for Europeans to look for and control mineral wealth. But sometimes the motivating factors were tied to specific events. And a very critical event in the history of Europe and the world was the impact of a series of eight events that were collectively known as the Crusades. From 1095 to 1270, there were a series of eight events called Crusades by European Christian militias, essentially, they called themselves Crusaders, to go to the Holy Land and regain control specifically of Jerusalem from the Muslims. Jerusalem, as you may know, is the center of three major religions, Islam, Christianity, and Judaism. And control of Jerusalem has shifted between those groups over the years. But for many years, Jerusalem was under the control of Muslims. And Christian crusaders felt they wanted to regain control of Jerusalem for Christianity, more specifically for Catholicism. And so there was a series of eight events uh, to the Holy Lands, mostly they failed, in attempts to regain control of Jerusalem for Christianity. Probably the most famous of the Crusades was the Crusade in 1212, that was called the Children's Crusade, in which there was a Crusader army that was made up almost exclusively of small children, uh, following the biblical admonition that a small child will lead you into the kingdom of heaven, the Crusader army was made up significantly of children. Uh, they were slaughtered. The impact of the Crusades was particularly felt 
by the Crusaders being introduced to previously unknown consumer and material goods. They wrote about it. They came back to Europe uh, with their stories of the uh, extraordinary things they had seen, different kinds of food and clothing and cultures, all of which influenced how they were going to live their life in Europe. Specifically, what the Crusaders brought back were stories of spices and fabrics and how these spices and fabrics could make your life a much better. There had been stories about spices and fabrics from a far away, almost mythical land known as Cathay or Chipongo, uh, that is today's Asia, China and Japan. Marco Polo wrote about this in the 13th century, for instance. But the Crusaders were very much attracted to the spices and fabrics that they, they found in the Holy Land. They found them desirable because of their life in Europe. Life in Europe was very difficult. Uh, most people had only one suit of clothes, usually made out of wool, and very few had made a connection between uh, the lack of cleanliness and disease. And so they were introduced to new kinds of fabric, Egyptian cotton, silk from the faraway lands of Cathay. And in particular, they were desirous of spices. Spices could make their food, which was often very bland in Europe, uh, taste better. And more significantly, uh, spices could preserve food for longer periods and uh, make them more readily available and, and more palatable. Spice was extraordinarily expensive. Uh, it is said at the time that a pound of spice fetched a pound of gold. And among uh, the other things that were particularly desirable was sugar. Sugar was very, very rare. Uh, in fact, it was quite common uh, later on in Europe in the 15th and 16th centuries that if you wanted to give somebody a very expensive gift, you gave them a little box of sugar because it was so rare and so expensive. But this desire for spices and fabrics very much influenced the Crusaders, and they took these stories back to Europe to people who were very much interested in these new consumer goods. The result of this is that Europeans started to look very seriously at exploring and becoming involved in the trade routes to the faraway lands in Asia of Cathay and Chipongo. This led to increased investment in the idea of exploration, of economic development due to interest and increased profits that could come from the Asian trade. Small communities in Europe gathered together, bonded together into larger units to pool their money in order to uh, fund exploration efforts uh, to faraway Asia. However, Europeans quickly discovered that they had a major obstacle to overcome, and that was that they simply did not possess adequate geographic or technological knowledge to successfully and profitably be involved in expansionism and exploration. They had to expand their knowledge base. And so, taking the lead was Portugal. Portugal was in the vanguard of European expansionism and exploration. And leading the way was their, was their ruler, uh, Prince Henry, who came to be known as Prince Henry the Navigator. And Prince Henry established a school to study the various aspects of seagoing trade and, uh, and technological development. His school of navigation studied shipbuilding, navigation techniques, map making, everything related to traveling on the oceans except warfare. Uh, studying uh, naval battles and, and the utilization of the seas for military purposes came later. Uh, Prince Henry is much more involved and interested in the commercial and trade benefits of ocean-going travel. Under Prince Henry's leadership, Portugal took the lead in developing and modifying uh, transportation systems and navigation techniques and map making to make them much more cost-effective and, and useful in uh, ocean-going travel. One of the major innovations of Prince Henry's school was the design of this boat, which is called a caravel, a Portuguese caravel, which looks much like other ships of the time period, 
but it was designed for long travel. It was sturdier. Its cargo hold was bigger. It could carry uh, larger cargoes than other ships of the time period. They had specially designed sails that could uh, capture the wind better. They were easy to sail and they were safe. And as a result, Portugal took the lead uh, in many of the, uh, the trading efforts and ex early explorations uh, during this time period. Another innovation was new navigational techniques. This is an astrolabe, which was a design, a very intricate design, uh, almost like a sculpture, uh, as a way to navigate and to locate your position uh, on the ocean. The astrolabe was an outgrowth of older techniques like the sextant, but became very sophisticated. And Portugal again took the lead in doing this. There are cultural historians today who believe that this intricate device was really one of the precursors to the development of technology that ultimately leads to our computer world today. Portugal and other European nations involved in exploration also quickly discovered that they need much improved maps. Map making had been in, in place, of course, for millennia, but the maps were often very rudimentary and inaccurate. The maps started to be much more detailed, much more sophisticated. This is an example. By our standards, this looks pretty uh, crude, but by the standards of the 16th century, this was a very sophisticated map. It shows clear outlines of the coastline. It shows a harbor in Santo Domingo. It shows the, uh, where the buildings are located. It shows the, uh, the size of the, uh, uh, the harbor and how many ships can be uh, uh, can be located there and it has these curious decorations down at the bottom. Historians have speculated about what these decorations mean, whether they were legends or symbols for uh, the sailors who were largely illiterate during this time period. Well, they may have been. Uh, the monster, the sea monster in the bottom right, may have been uh, a symbol of dangerous seas or rock outcroppings or perhaps some curious natural phenomenon that they saw there. Or they may simply have been decorations filling in the space in the map. Uh, historians are of two minds about this and no decision has really been, uh, been reached about what these symbols mean. But they certainly are uh, decorative additions uh, to these maps. That's the end of the first part of this lecture on motivations. In part two, I'll be looking at one of the most significant motivations of the time period, which is religion, religious conflicts, and the development of religious movements like the Protestant Reformation.